I'm going to welcome everyone this evening. This is a, another in a series of small group meetings by members of the Reston community, the Reston Association, and the Fairfax County representatives to address areas of citizens' concerns with the county's proposed zoning amendment to increase the density for the Reston pres uh, planned residential community. As you know, earlier sessions have been held with uh, in a dialogue on transportation, parks, and facilities and schools, and tonight we're all going to be discussing planning. Could I, I, can people hear me in the room? Good, thank you. Uh, I'd like to begin with introductions. Obviously, uh, I'm Bruce Ramo. I'm a member of Reclaim Reston and a participant in the Coalition for Planned, uh, Planned Reston. Also participating from CPR are Dennis Hayes, president of the Reston Citizen Association, and Tammy Petrine, co-chair of Reston 2020. I'm going to ask the representatives of the county and the Reston Association to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Fred Seldon with Fairfax County Department of Planning and Zoning. I'm Leslie Johnson uh, with the Zoning Administration Division. And I'm Kathy Belgian, also with Zoning Administration. And I'm Lori Stone. I'm, I'm Planning Section Manager for the Fire and Rescue Department. Nice to see you guys. Thanks for coming. <laughs> I'm Andy Siegel. I'm the president of the Reston Association Board of Directors. Larry Butler, acting CEO of the Reston Association. And John Mooney of the Reston Association Board of Directors. Well, thank you for being here. I appreciate it on a rainy night that we have a nice group of citizens here, and we really appreciate our guests here tonight uh, joining us for this discussion. For the benefit of putting everybody on the same page, literally, I'd give a little bit of the background of what brought us here this evening and then turn to the agenda that uh, we've worked out previously and I think Fred, we have uh, really are going to be following the one last one we received from you. So we appreciate that. Um, last year, the county announced a plan to amend the Fairfax zoning ordinance um, to increase the overall per acre density limitation for the planned residential community, the PRC, from 13 to 16 persons, and to provide authority for the Board of Supervisors to approve individual development in excess of 50 dwelling units per acre under certain circumstances. Since that time, Restonians have engaged in a variety of in, um, interactions with the supervisor and the county staff to better understand the proposal and to suggest alternatives. Uh, last November, the RA provided Supervisor Hudgens a letter identifying nine actions it sought in connection with the PRC District Zoning Ordinance, and earlier this year, following a series of community meetings to discuss possible alternatives, uh, the CPR, the Coalition for Planned Reston, sent Supervisor Hudgens specific proposed changes to the Reston Master Plan uh, that we believe will eliminate the perceived need for the county's proposed amendments to the zoning ordinance to raise the density cap. Earlier this year, the county responded to our letters and to the RA it's a letter, and since then we've engaged with the cooperation of the supervisor in a series of meetings, large meetings, and, and a series of small, smaller meetings that I mentioned earlier. And this session, um, like those is to enable a more in-depth discussion of some of the key issues that the community has been raising with concerning the growth of Reston over the next 25 to 30 years as reflected in the, 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 mas the master plan and in the proposed zoning amendments. Um, I want to emphasize that for those of us who have been working from the community, we recognize that the extension of the Silver Line, with that extension, Reston will be welcoming new neighbors, new businesses, and we are committed to grow in a ways that will respect and protect the unique characteristics of our community, including diversity, respect for the environment, ample open space and recreation, quality education, and public safety, and benefits for all of a planned community. With that in mind, I think, as we've discussed in other sessions, that we can agree that the planning principles of the Reston Master Plan serve as 
guideposts for the discussion we're going to have this evening. And in particular, those concerning planning, phasing of infrastructure, continuation of a mix of urban and suburban lifestyles, housing for all ages and incomes, quality open spaces, and the significance, as reflected here, of public participation in planning and zoning. So regarding our agenda, with that introduction, so we're all level set, um, we exchanged ideas for agenda with um, members of the county staff, and that we'll be following that agenda this, this evening. Um, I believe that begins with a summary of the comprehensive plan recommendations and implementation strategies, followed by more in-depth discussions of three key areas that we um, had discussed about in earlier meetings with the county. The population target, village centers, and, and two neighborhood issues. Uh, with that, um, I just wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of our agenda. The only thing that um, I believe was a carryover from your last meeting is there were some questions about public safety dealing with fire and rescue and police. Uh, Lori Stone is here from Fire and Rescue and can address those questions tonight. And, and I've been in contact with Major O'Connell in the police department who will get us a, a response to those questions about police. Those were operational questions, quite frankly. They didn't deal with facilities. They just dealt with things like hiring and, and things of that nature. So again, we, we thought a written response was appropriate there. Um, but again, there are some recommendations in the comp plan regarding fire and rescue facilities that Lori can speak to. Now we can do that before we get into some of the planning issues or after whatever is the, the sense of the group is fine. I think the sense of the group, and we, uh, we've discussed it, is that we'd like to focus on the planning, recognizing that we want to get to that, um, okay. and we hope to get to that. So I appreciate you being here. Well, thank I'm, you so much. And exactly. I'm sure this will be so stimulating that uh, <laughs> uh, discussion that it'll be well worth the trip in the right rain. Mm -hmm. um, okay. right. Well, would you like me to listen to me? I'd like to just give a brief overview of the comp plan, the process that we went to, through, and, and, and what the comp plan, comprehensive plan for Rest and Trust to, um, to outline and accomplish. We started the planning process, I think it was prior to 2010. I think Tammy would, would remember when we did the Land Use College, which was a community outreach to go over some of the basics of planning and zoning. Um, it was a series of sessions that we had that were open to anybody in the community um, so that everybody would hopefully get at least some brief overview as to what is the comprehensive plan and how it relates to the future growth and development of the community, as well as the relationship of the comprehensive plan to the zoning ordinance, which is an implementation tool of the plan. Uh, we started in 2010, and our focus was on the transit station areas because <clears throat> we knew that the Metro Line uh, Silver Line was being extended. Phase one of the Silver Line had a station at Wheelie Avenue, uh, but phase two had uh, three additional stations, uh, one at Town Center, one at Wheelie, uh, Herndon Monroe, and one in uh, the Route 28 area uh, that's called Innovation Station. And those station areas, while there was some general guidance about mixed-use development, it really wasn't what we would call um, a transit-oriented development plan. Um, for many of you who go back to the original master plan for Reston, it showed the corridor as being industrial, which at that time really meant uh, research and development because those were the types of industrial uses that they were planning to have in the corridor. But again, the corridor was zoned industrial, uh, as of, and still there are a lot of properties that have um, what we call I-5 or I-3 industrial zoning, uh, which does allow for office development, which is what has mostly occurred, um, but also can allow for other things like self-storage, which you've also seen in some parts of the corridor, as well as data centers. Um, but in looking at the plan for Reston, the thought was we should be encouraging additional residential development in close proximity to the station as well as employment uses. So the basis of um, TOD planning is mixed use, residential and employment uses and walking distance to metro, and trying to have the types of amenities that would facilitate a walkable community. Because one of the things that 
research has found is that people are more likely to walk further distances to get to a station if there are things along the way. If it's a, if it's a, if it's a walk that has barriers or if it's barren, people's tendency will not be to walk. But if you give them something that's uh, interesting and exciting and you make the walk um, as, as, as convenient and easy as possible, people will walk further distances. So that's the basis of the TOD planning that went into effect for the station areas in Reston. And again, those station areas were replanned, and the plan for those station areas, we did it in two phases. The first phase of the, of the plan update focused on the station areas, and that was adopted in 2014. We then focused on what some people call the rest of Reston, um, but it was those areas in Reston outside of the transit station areas. And the focus of the planning effort for those areas was to try to identify existing development and plan the areas in the communities of Reston as stable residential neighborhoods. <clears throat> the original plan for Reston had a lot of latitude for what could happen in any uh, area of Reston. There were three broad residential categories, low, medium, and high. And you had a lot of latitude to develop different types of housing uh, in those categories. In my view, that was an appropriate plan for the time that we were in, which was a lot of farmland being converted to residential and a lot of flexibility and freedom given to the master developer, who started out as Robert Simon and then morphed into other entities. But they had the ability to choose, oh, in this area, we're going to do a cluster of single family homes and in in a, in a single family detached houses. Other places we can put some townhouses, multifamily. The developer had a lot of flexibility into how the community was going to develop over time. When we looked at the plan, one of the things that concerned us was that flexibility was fine for the first, what I would call the first development. But you did want to have an area that had a high, high density residential category and had been developed with low density housing. So one of the things that we tried to do was to reconcile what was actually built and on the ground and existing um, and align that with the various densities. That's why we went from three categories to, I don't know, it's probably 12 now. Um, but that was purposefully, purposefully done to recognize the stable residential areas in Reston and to not have redevelopment occur that was not consistent with the comprehensive plan. We also planned the golf courses to be golf courses because in the previous plan, I think there were golf courses, open space, and, and we specifically, because we knew that the preservation of golf courses in the plan was, a, was something that was of significance to the community. And there clearly was, in our thinking, the, the need and desire to reinforce the golf courses the same way we were reinforcing the various communities for their various densities. Um, and we did, during that process, a lot of the time and attention and energy of the staff and the community dealt with the village centers. And what was the future of the village centers? Because we had previously gone through a replanning effort for Lake Ann that predated 2010, it was probably around 2007, that we replanned Lake Ann for redevelopment. <clears throat> and we had workshops with the community to look at all of the village centers and to say what should happen with each one. What the plan says now is that no village center should be redeveloped without a plan in place. That plan should be, it says a plan should be developed in conjunction with the community and it should be evaluated based on its impacts on facilities within Reston. That, that's step one to anybody who wants to redevelop a village center. And originally, when the staff report came forward, it said specifically that you had to do a comprehensive plan amendment at the same time that you were doing this plan, that the plan that was referenced was a, was a comprehensive plan amendment. Uh, when the plan went to the planning commission, there was testimony 
on in on all sides, but the Planning Commission thought that that having what's called a PRC plan or a development plan was sufficient and that you didn't need that, that extra step of a comprehensive plan amendment before you could come forward with a plan to redevelop one of the village centers. And again, all of the language in the plan about it being a collaborative replanning in conjunction with the community and, and evaluation of impacts is still in the comp plan. Um, but that's, again, the plan that was adopted it does not require a comprehensive plan amendment for a village center to, to at least initiate and go through the thought process of redevelopment. Um, in terms of infrastructure, um, the plan is far more specific today than, it's, than it ever was with respect to what we identified as needs in terms of parks, schools, public facilities, and transportation improvements. Um, and you've heard from some of the other work groups, working sessions, that there's a lot that's been done to try to uh, secure funding as well as to identify how these future needs will be met. But recognize that the plan is a long range plan. Um, we have one milestone of 2030, which we, which we would say is the near term. And then the long, -term, long range is a 2050 vision. Um, I would say that the build out of the complete plan probably goes beyond 2050, particularly when you go back and look at the forecast that we had. Um, and one of the things that I think has gotten um, perhaps misunderstood, plans, don't gen plans in and of themselves don't generate growth. Um, we still are, growth is still related to economics, it's still related to uh, other growth factors. Um, it's, it's not something that just because you plan for X amount of office or X amount of retail or X amount of residential, that, it's, that it is ensured that it will happen. Um, and in fact, more often than not, it does not happen. Um, and Reston is not an island. So it's in competition with Tyson's, with the Route 28 corridor, with other parts of Fairfax County, um, with Montgomery County, with the District of Columbia, with Arlington, Alexandria. So when you look at particularly job growth, the way it's looked at is it's looked at as the region has an economy and that regional economy is going to grow at a certain rate and they're going to generate a certain number of jobs. And then those jobs will probably be dispersed throughout the region based on kind of where employers want to locate. We've seen biomedical employees, employers going to be out near NIH in the Montgomery County area. <laughs> Fairfax County has been very successful in getting cybersecurity and other things that are related to that sector of the job growth. So if our future job growth, let's say, is skewed toward biomedical and bioscience, um, the odds are it's, it's, it's going to go out to Montgomery County in the, in the Wisconsin Avenue area, or it will probably go to Merrifield with what Inova is planning to do there in terms of a magnet. Right now, I would say Reston does not have a magnet for those types of jobs. So I say that to say that when we look at future growth, just because the plan says there's the potential for this growth to occur, uh, there are many, many, many factors that go into whether or not that growth will actually be realized. Um, I'd like to close by saying that one of the things that we've been trying to do, because one of the assessments of this whole effort is the PRC zoning, and it has a, currently has a cap of 13 persons per acre, which we think will accommodate a certain amount of growth of the comprehensive plan, but not all the growth that was anticipated in the comp plan. Um, we're looking at those areas, and, and I've highlighted some areas where I think we can refine our numbers, because when we pull those numbers together, we did them, I'll call it, on a gross aggregate basis. So for example, the village centers, we just said, we just took the land area and a maximum of 50 DUs per acre and applied it. And that number is probably overly generous in terms of potential. Um, and we've gone back and refined those numbers. Um, and, and we'll keep doing that. But again, 
you're still talking about future growth and development and how you want to accommodate that future growth and development um, through the PRC zoning ordinance. And again, rightly or wrongly, when staff approached the phase two plan for Reston, what we thought the plan did was protect stable neighborhoods, not undermine them, um, had some modest growth in areas outside of the transit station area, and those areas were the village centers, the area north of Barron Cameron where the Home Depot is, and that area used to be a used to be defined as being in the town center. And we said, no, we don't think that that should be, still have a town center designation. But, it, but we did put a recommendation in that allowed for redevelopment of that area with mixed use. Um, and I think um, St. John's Woods um, was a multifamily complex that previously had a high density, high density designation um, they submitted, when we did the plan, we offered anybody in Reston the opportunity to propose changes to any particular land area, and the owners of that land submitted a nomination um, to re initially to retain the 50 DUs per acre. Um, I think they, they reduced it somewhat, but that redevelopment option was a result of a specific plan nomination that was put in the process, was reviewed as a part of the process, and, and was adopted. Um, again, everybody had that op opportunity and option. Um, they availed themselves of it. Um, but that's the one area that I can think of, of all the multifamily communities that are <coughs> out there. Um, that came in through the process. Now, there are two other areas, um, Charter Oaks and um, where the Harrison are, that while it appears that there's additional above 50, uh, it really isn't. And I'll explain that when we get into some of the, uh, the details of the discussion. Um, but with that, I'm, I'm open. And uh, Leslie and Kathy are here, and we're, we're happy to go through it. Um, was there a question that the other participants wanted to address in the context of the discussion about the, the comprehensive plan recommendations? Just <clears throat> earlier we had a little bit discussion on this also, and, and if, if you could just clarify, what, what do you consider to be urban in Reston for your planning purposes? Well, that's, that's a, <clears throat> excuse me, that's a challenging question because well, it, it. It, it depends <laughs> on, well, some people think of urban as uh, tall buildings, um, and clearly some of the buildings in the town center, um, given that this is Fairfax County and not, you know, Chicago, would, at 21, 22 stories would be deemed as an urban style of building, an urban okay, style well, of development. I, I asked the question because, uh, again, this is in my area, but my understanding is that in terms of services that are provided, it makes a difference if an area is considered urban or, or suburban or exurban or whatever. Oh, yes. So, I mean, uh, yeah. uh, what, uh, do you have a, a line? I mean, we, I would have a line, which is basically TSA. Uh, you know, there it is. Uh, <laughs> NRTC. But, but, not, okay. but not PRC. The PRC is not urban. No, so we'll, I, we'll, I would agree, we'll with, agree that. with that. Okay. Right. Perfect. That would get the portion. I'm excluding, you said the TSA, but yep. part of the TSA is the town center area. Yeah. So it. excluding that, yes, I would agree. But not the PRC. Yeah. That's what I was looking for. What do you mean yeah. by the PRC? Just the entire PRC itself? Because right. that's there a zoning. There are parts of PRC that parts are in the, the town center. The, the, that right. Yeah, there's some excluded. overlap, but no. basically. Yeah. I don't think, again, I don't think we, we viewed, again, when we think of urban, we think of a higher density. We think of, yeah. uh, you know, when we say, urban park spaces and things of that nature, right. that's okay. what I'm worried about. Okay. Right. Thank you. Go right ahead. Just, just one general observation uh, in response to Fred's um, helpful general overview. This is my beaten up copy of the Ruston Master Plan. And uh, it, it contains both the phase one work and the phase two work, so the TSAs and the non-TSAs. Um, 
the more I live with this and read it and hear other discussions, the more I fear that though those two parts are bound together in one book, that they were not really integrated at the end of the two planning processes. And that the implications, for example, of TSA development on the rest of Reston um, are not adequately taken into consideration. And as I had the opportunity to mention during the transportation session, uh, I see no evidence, although I'm awaiting to get some further information from Tom Bozotsny, uh, that the impacts of the TSA traffic has been modeled for the rest of Reston. So that would be another instance where uh, in, in our uh, planning effort, we, we did not fully integrate phase one and phase two. So that's a general concern I have. If I could follow up on that point, I think one of the, as we discuss the, the rest of the agenda, I think this notion of one rest in is placed, placed to that because just the notion of having these two separate phases in some respects plays into a notion of that this, uh, the way the plan affects all of Reston was not all the way considered when you when it was divided into two parts. So without, we'll talk some more about that, but when I think a theme from the community has, has been that across a number of the topics that we have to, that we're looking at rest in not just in the context of what happens in the, the PRC zoning um, right. density, we're looking at the effect of of uh, the master plan on all of Reston. And we're going to talk in the next session, section of our discussion tonight about the, uh, the, the population cap, by way of an example. That will reflect very well the, the community's concerns that plays to a, a number of, of issues. Um, did I, is there any other comments on this subject? I, I, I wanted to say that both CPR and RA have provided suggestions for clarifying and improving the, the master plan um, with the thought that adjusting the master plan will relieve some of the issues that are leading to the need, the perceived need of raising the zoning density cap. And the, the subjects that would have been the subject of the small group play into that. Um, and what we would hope to recognize tonight, and, and I think you've, you've raised this in, at least in the response to the letters to the CPR and RA in, in March, that we recognize that you've cited a practice of not amending the comprehensive plan within five years of their adoption, but you have expressed a willingness to consider changes to the plan that clarify uh, that correct oversights or are editorial nature. So we see that as at least a good first step to address, as an opportunity to address some of our concerns. But I think in other contexts that we'll be discussing, we have clearly understood that real substantive changes beyond clarifications or correction of oversights have been made to other plans. Um, so we would, although we certainly appreciate the, the correct, the notion of correction and that the door is open to, to make, uh, clarify, to clarify and to, and to deal with corrections or oversights, we are of a mind that what we're asking for in terms of some of the things tonight regarding the master plan have been done in other instances for other um, master plans for other communities in the county. Um, I've been with the county a, a long time, <clears throat> which is both a blessing and a curse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Fred, it's, that's it's so a, It's sad. a blessing, and uh, I can say <laughs> I can't recall of any circumstance where we've done a major planning study 
<laughs> and have come back in and changed some of the land use density, intensity, and use recommendations within five years. Now, that being said, time I've been with the county, if somebody can, can show me or, or sit down and identify places, I'm, I'm certainly welcome to, to that. But all I can say is I've worked with a lot of major planning studies. Um, I've done three for Reston. I was involved in, this, in the replanning of the Carta in the early 90s. In, to, in 2000, when they first started talking about metro stations in the area, and then in 2010. Same thing for Tyson's. Um, and while the Tyson's plan was adopted in 2010, we did some editorial changes, um, but, and that was just last recently. Yeah. Was so we haven't even opened Tyson's up to, uh, again, changing major uses. But again, if people have examples, I'm certainly willing to, to look at them, and, and I can certainly be corrected on that point. Um, but I think I'm accurate in saying that our practice has not been to go in and, and make those types of changes. In some respects, it respects the process that we went through. Uh, and again, I, can, I went back. One of the things that, that's, that's interesting now is you can go back and look at public hearings um, before the Planning Commission and Board. And I did that for the hearings in 2014 and 2015. And I was curious as to, well, what was RA's position? And RA had some concerns, but overall, when the plan was adopted, RA was fully in support of it, talked about it in glowing terms. Um, so you have to respect. Now, I'll be the first to say communities change, people change, attitudes change. But when we spend five years working on a plan, that gets adopted with almost uni you know, unanimous support, and certainly a lot of support, it's hard to then come back one year later, two years later, three years later. So we've, and again, we've said five years we think is a, is a, is a good period of time. It allows the plan to, to start having some implementation behind it before you go in and start making changes, because quite frankly, if you say, well, let's open up the plan anytime there's community concern or community interest, you almost will always have an open plan. You'll never have it set. And if you never have it set, again, there's no predictability to it. Go back and look at Bob Simon's plan. The only thing I can say is that the plan that we have that goes through 89 has some amended dates on it. And my guess is there are only about a half dozen amended dates. So that meant from 68 to 89, it, it, it wasn't wholesale amendments to it. it I'm sorry, Andy. Um, I have a tangential point to that one. And so, and, and Fred, I'd ask you to help me just get my head around it. So we talk about this plan kind of as a sacrosanct thing for this five years, to some degree. And, and you've just described why you think it is. And, and, it, and to a lot of points, I, I agree with you. You know, that makes sense. It, we should respect the work that went on, and for that part, that makes sense. I'm just trying to get my head around implementation cases. Like, I, I wrote down one. Like the case of the Pulte Homes, RZ 2015HM005, approved in November of 2016, where the staff of Planning and Zoning, I believe, as I read this, said something like, however, the lack of high-quality open space and site design as envisioned by the comprehensive plan, remains of substantive concern. Staff concludes that the application as proposed is not in conformance with the comprehensive plan and all applicable zoning provisions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So we have a plan that we're saying is pretty sacrosanct, and we want to make sure it's followed because we are, we are wanting to make sure that we believe in what was done, and, and yet, we're, we're passing things that our own staff has said it's not in conformance with the plan. So in one sense, it's sacrosanct, and in the other sense, it's not. But so just help me get my head around that. Well, that, that to me is the beauty of the process. The beauty of the process is that it is not just staff's call. It's the community's call. <laughs> and the community, again, it is. And 
while there are development applications, the majority of them, staff supports it, the community supports it, the Planning Commission and Board of Supervisors. But that's the process. And my guess is if you go back, that Pulte application could have had the support of PNZ. I don't, I don't recall, but it wouldn't surprise me if, if that application in and of itself wasn't supported. There have been other applications in Reston, uh, the Ackridge office building. I know staff didn't support it. The community was somewhat divided on that. I know there were some people in town center who didn't support it. But there were a lot of people in Reston who did support it. And again, the plan is a guide. It's, 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 not, it's not a set in stone rule book that says it has to be X or Y. You look at it, it's a guide. There are a lot of things that it's trying to achieve. No application, my guess, is, will be perfect in achieving a whole, the full range of everything that it wants to achieve between open space and amenities and public art and green buildings and transportation and parks and public facilities, you name it. There's a lot there. And there's probably no application that's going to satisfy everybody's thought as to uh, is it doing all the things that the plan suggests and the plan is recommending? And that's why judgment comes in, and that's why, quite frankly, before any zoning is adopted, it goes through a process by which the community hears it, vets it, articulates its concerns through whatever vehicle it has, and typically in most parts of Fairfax County, that's a land use committee or some kind of planning and zoning committee. I think RA, I've looked at some of your meetings. I think you were, you were briefed on them by Larry and his staff. You consider them. You look at them. You come to your judgment. And then it goes to the Planning Commission that brings its judgment to the process, and then ultimately to the Board of Supervisors. So it's through collective review, discussion, and judgment that we get to you know, what's finally approved. And it doesn't put staff in any, in any place that's higher or lower than anybody else. I mean, we make our, our called professional judgment, but quite frankly, the community has to give its judgment. And sometimes its judgment is different from that of the staff, and sometimes its judgment is different from that of the Planning Commission or Board. And, and I guess just to finalize that, thank you very much for that answer. It was, I, makes sense. I, I just say, as much as I think you're asking us to understand that things morph, that there's a, pro there's, there's a process, and even though things, applications are not in conformance with a plan, that sometimes they go through for many different reasons. I think all we're saying is, if you'd give us that latitude too, that this is not sacrosanct and we have to follow it, because it's, we have evidences where it's not being followed, that if there's areas that need update from oversight, or we learn new things and it's time to incorporate those new things into the plan, at least in some areas, it, it may make sense, yeah. is all we're saying. No, and I, and, I, and I thought I expressed an openness to, to those kinds of, of changes. If, if clarif clarif something needs to be clarified, something needs to be corrected, if there's additional information that could be helpful, um, those are all things that, that again, um, so certainly staff is open to. One, one other thing that I would caution you on is, that when you look at a zoning application, the staff report is written at one, one point in time. Yeah. And sometimes applications change, sometimes based on the comments from staff. So sometimes there are changes that are made. So you'd almost have to go back to the public hearing and see what was the staff recommendation at the time of the public hearing. I appreciate Thank that. Did you have one um, additional you, comment? You yeah. I just. <clears throat> And this is not the first time we've talked with these good people about these issues. So as we discussed in an earlier meeting, Fred, when you talked about the uncertainty within which you need to do your work and we need to do our work, um, we, we talked about a bit more about the approach taken with Tyson's Corner um, comprehensive plan amendment in 2017. So the Tyson's Corner plan had last been amended in 2014. So in 2017, in conjunction with the adoption of the corresponding zoning ordinance amendment, some, ch some points were added to consideration of the comprehensive plan itself. And I just wanted to, to note some of the things that were said. So 
these changes go beyond monitoring or correcting oversights in the plan or uh, correcting uh, mistakes, uh, you know, technical mistakes, but it had to do, it goes to the very uncertainty we're talking about. When you're dealing with planning, okay. when you're dealing with uh, actual development, it's uncertain what will happen and when it will happen. And so among the things that those 2017 amendments, again, not a major redo of the comprehensive plan, but the opening to some sub substantive amendments. Among other things, those 2017 amendments provided stronger guidance on the location of parks and active recreation space, monitoring and experience-based adjustments on the relationship between development and transportation, and perhaps most importantly, for ongoing, and this is a quote, detailed planning in order to refine and update the general guidance in the comprehensive plan, which will be better informed by completed studies and other planning elements over time. So it's as we walk down the road, we learn new things, and we may change our path because of what we've learned along the road. And it, so it's in that spirit that we would hope that the precedent that you set with Tyson's, at least in, in what you, how you said you will treat the comprehensive plan, would be accorded to us also. No, we, I, I have no problem in, in committing to do that because what happened with Tyson's is in 2017, which is seven years after the adoption of the plan, they had multiple zoning cases that had gone through. And where those zoning cases had implemented parts of the grid of streets, implemented parts of the park system, and made commitments, they then reflected those in some of the maps that were shown in the, in the plan. So the major change is in the grid of streets. If you look at the 2010 plan, it has a much finer grid, grain grid because it was conceptual. And it had block sizes going down to probably 300 to 13 uh, feet in block length. What was actually coming through the zoning cases were larger blocks. We couldn't get the zoning cases to get that refined a grid of streets. So the block sizes are probably more in the 500, 400 to 600 foot length. And that's what you see were some of the changes. So again, it was trying to reconcile what was conceptual in the plan starting with how it had been implemented through zoning cases. And again, I would see the same thing happening in in Reston, as we have zoning cases that implement things like Reston Station Boulevard east of Wheelie. Uh, we kind of know where that will go and kind of where it will come out. So we have a lot more just through the zoning cases and what's been um, dedicated or set aside for that road, which may be different from the way it was articulated in the, in the plan. The same way that the plan, I think, is trying to articulate a public street paralleling the toll road that I think will be more like a, a private street of service connection. It'll be a connection, but it's not a, a major road connection. So those changes, so that's that's kind of what, so. We'd like yes. that memorialized. There's, there's no problem. As we proceed. proceed. Yeah. Just, if I could quickly, uh, as Annie pointed out, I mean, the language uh, from the staff report, I think, is, is indicative of some of the concerns we have. And again, it's not just the one project, because we know each project is unique and there, things happen all, along the way. Uh, the concern, I would say, we have is the cumulative effect, that every project seems to be lacking certain things, certain uh, contributions to the community, and that cumulatively, these add up until they become a, a big point. And look, I came to Reston in 1979. Uh, I became active on these issues about two to three years ago, and the reason I became active is because I started seeing my kids were, were in trailers uh, at school. Uh, it took me forever to get from one side of Reston to the other. That there's uh, the park, you know, the parks are, are, are oversubscribed and everything. So those are the things that came, and those didn't happen because of one project or another. They happened because of all of these projects put together. And, and I think what Bruce had alluded to earlier is 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 we we want to see all of this stuff come together and so when you have uh, gateway which is going to be voted on tomorrow uh, and also town center west is being voted on tomorrow uh, 2580 or so dwelling units that, that come with that uh, but i look at it and correct me because maybe i don't have the best information uh, i don't see any parks uh, coming out of that uh, i don't see any you know traffic uh, amelioration coming out of that 
So it's not that we're opposed to development. It's just that the point I think we're trying to make is the comprehensive plan has calls for everybody to kind of pitch in and, and meet certain standards. And we see development coming in, but not meeting those standards. And then more development comes in on top of that, on top of that, on top of that. So let's, let's figure out how we can pull it all together, and, and maybe it'll work. I, I want to close this portion, because actually we, we had, we're well beyond what, the, what we <laughs> thought we'd have on this topic. And we have some additional topics. And I, I appreciate the give and take. And I, I also take from this that the sense of the discussion is that there we'll take a look at reasonable things that might uh, be clarifications or, or perhaps even more substantive in, in the master plan. There are other examples, but what we took from your comment in your letter was that the door is open for some, some adjustments, appropriate adjustments, and how far that goes and what makes sense will be determined. So if the door is open for some possibility there, um, which I took from your letter that that was the case, the, the, we'll bring it up in terms of the specific um, concerns of the community. And I think the concerns of the community that we were going to raise tonight began with uh, uh, the overall population cap for Reston. Um, so I'm, I'm moving us on to that subject, okay. if you don't mind. I, 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 uh, it, it is an opportunity to, we don't have this kind of close dialogue often, it's, but, uh, but we have lots of things to discuss. Um, the overall population cap, just for the make everyone again on the same page, um, the RA in last November uh, made the recommendation um, pointing out that there had been a, a population cap in prior um, arrest and master plans. And they called for um, a population cap um, to be in the plan and that it should include both affordable dwelling units and workforce housing. Um, the C CPR itself went somewhat further recommending um, specific number of persons um, for a well-balanced growth of the population community-wide cap of 120,000 people, including, again, those affordable housing and ADU, WD units. Um, again, just summarizing so we're on the same page, um, my understanding is, again, that, and this was a positive in terms of that we can make some progress, that, this, that you said the staff can support the inclusion of a future population target as part of the vision of Reston. And, and we have some, we don't have a direct agreement on cap versus target, but I think the notion is here that, mon that as well toward the point of including all the citizens, the suggest your suggestion was that it should be based on information from the U.S. Census rather than a formula of the PRC uh, provisions in the zoning ordinance. And I think that would appear to be the makings of agreement on, on this point, which is, which is very positive. Um, one of the things that, uh, though, that uh, is of concern is how do we, is, did the community really understand, do we, do they understand when, they, when the master plan was put together and do we understand now what the, uh, that growth target or target uh, or cap might be? Um, I thought that in the context of talking about the 120,000 person recommendation for the all of Reston, and again, um, we're not just talking about the PRC, we're talking about um, the portions of Reston that are um, overlapped and the portions of Reston that are just in TSAs, but in the boundaries of, as you have pointed out many times to us, the boundaries of, uh, of Reston. Um, I wanted to take a few moments to kind of make sure we all understand the numbers, because our number, uh, understanding the numbers that are recommended from the master plan, because to me, uh, that, was, that is one of the more startling things that when you spend some time looking at those numbers, you feel um, a, a, a sense of concern that this, that, uh, that uh, has been expressed, uh, it becomes, it really builds up. 
Um, so help, help me understand that what runs <coughs> on some of these numbers. Uh, I went back and looked at <coughs> what was suggested was the maximum build out for the PRC. And uh, uh, from uh, the report, from the presentation that was made on the, the zoning uh, amendment, it identified 102,819 people for the PRC alone, which is based on, based on a little over 14,000 additional residential units. Um, and we understand that that's not, to your point, it's not going to happen immediately. But we, we wanted to understand what the, what, where our master plan, what we put in that master plan. Um, and then we thought, of course, we have to consider, if we're looking at one rest in all the folks in the TSAs. There's three TSAs. One of them overlaps with the PRC. Um, we were, we understand that there's 44,000 residential units planned for the TSAs. That represents at 2.1 residents per, resi per unit, 90, a little over 92,000 residents in the TSAs. Um, we then thought, well, you just can't add those two numbers. Um, you have to net out the overlap. And um, very, the most generous net out of the overlap is to take out all those folks that are all the additional units that are in the PRC, the 14,000 units. So you're, you net about 30,000 units in the TR, T, uh, new, new units in the TSA that are not included in that PRC number. So that um, is, when you take those numbers, and I'll add them up in a minute, um, in the context of what we're, of our current population, and what is the current population of this one rest in? Again, I turn to my information, I turn to the county. The county informed us in, uh, in 2017 that the, the population in 2016 was 60, Population, not not just not for zoning purposes, but real people. Sixty-two thousand seven hundred and eighty-three people um, um, in the uh, in 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 Reston. So, what we thought was right now, as we read the the plan, there are, and we add some folks in for ADU and, and, and WDUs in the PRC, we get to, and I can give you all these numbers, we get to over 175,000 population that, based on the recommended densities of the rest and master plan. And, um, and I don't know, and one of the things we wanted to discuss with you was, this cumulative number that comes from taking these densities from the PRC and the TSA, um, whether that was part of the cons consideration um, in the master plan or did this kind of sneak up on us uh, uh, in terms of we brought the shopping cart in, we put in the densities, put in the densities, but only when we check out do we recognize how many, how much population we were potentially facilitating. Uh, so. The we can argue, we could talk about the, the, you know the exact oh. numbers, but that's the, that the neighborhood about 175,000, and I could and in some respects it's been okay. pointed out to me that that may be a low number. What what I'd like to do is and because I know people's eyes will glaze over if we get too deep into this conversation because yep. there are a couple there, there are two things that are happening here. One is the PRC zoning ordinance computes population by use of a formula. It uses the, the type of housing unit, it applies a household size to that unit, and then it generates a population. So again, it's how many single family homes are there in Reston, how many townhouses are there in Reston, how many uh, multifamily homes are there in Reston, and it just applies a straight formula. One of the things that we know is that that number has always been significantly higher than the census number. 
And I would say the census number is probably the most accurate number of people in Reston. Because when you use a population factor, that factor is a countywide factor. And there may be any number of reasons why households in Reston are smaller than households in the county. But I can just tell you, every time we have tried to go back and compare the population of Reston vis-a-vis -vis what, the, what the formula tells us, we've known that the number is significantly higher. And, and, and what I'd like to do is, and even the census number is higher. I brought a map. Unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't put it up on the wall, but it's, I'll, I'll leave a copy with you. The census geography, the, the, the easiest one that most closely aligns with Reston's boundary are zip codes. And when you look at those three zip codes and you add them up, you come up with a number that's somewhere between 62 and 63, depending on whether it's 2016 or 2015 or 2017. But that area of Reston, that the census area, is larger. So we know that that's an overcount. And we can help work. We, we did this once before back in 2007 where we were using census tracts. And there's some areas that are, there's an area like north of Lawyers Road that, again, is not a part of Reston. There's a big cutout, but it is a part of that census tract. There's some areas up around Barron, Cameron, and Route 7 that are, again, that are in a census tract that has most of Reston but are not considered parts of Reston. So I think it's probably more productive that DPZ staff work with RA staff in coming up with what are the ground rules for determining the population of Reston. And once we do that, we'll know what that number is based on what the census is. We can then look at, OK, how do we, how do we treat new units coming in? I would suggest, given the types of units happening in the transit station areas, using a factor 2.1, while that may be the countywide multifamily factor, is probably going to overestimate the number of people. So I would say, look at, look at a range. Well, what would 1.9 be? Or, again, because you're talking about, unlike some multifamily developments where there are mainly one, two, and three bedrooms, you're talking about studio efficiencies, one bedroom, and two bedrooms. Um, there are a lot of empty nesters that are gravitating to moving into around transit station areas. Uh, that's what we found at Vienna Metro. It, it was, I was quite shocked to see that some of the condo developments, and some of them started as apartments, converted to condos, but there are a lot of empty nesters, which means that the household size was much smaller than you might um, suggest from uh, the, the dwelling unit type. So the 30-year-olds moved back in. Well, that's possible. And that that's happens. But, but, I'll, but, I'll be, but I'll be candid. One of the things that pushes against it is, is the cost. Um, uh, you know, and, and I wish we, and that's a, that's a different conversation, but one of the things that's challenging in some of our metro station areas are the units, as you saw, the townhouse units that have gone in along Sunrise Valley Drive are not what I call starter homes. Now, they may be starters for some people, yeah, well, <laughs> but, but not starter homes Bezos. for most. <laughs> So more than likely, you're either going to get some, you may get some families, but I would suggest you may get some empty nesters in there as well. And Go I on. would like to say, um, I live in Reston, and I drive around, and I will tell you, and I'm not going to tell you where it is, but in some of the houses, there are so many cars parked outside. Now, you would think this would be a Colmore thing or another area of the county, somewhere a whole bunch of people are, and, and if, if the zoning found them, they would, you know, have these places shut down. Be, but we are, we be have, careful. Be we, careful. we have, as, as somebody who has two adult children living with them, we've got, we've got more cars than most of our No, no, no. <laughs> I'm talking about you can't get a parking spot. Because, and these are not children. These are adults that are sharing. The other um, issue of that is 
the areas I think you meant south of Lawyers Road, didn't you, that aren't technically like Fox Mill no, Woods? There's, there's a, Where is it north a, of there's a Lawyers? Probably Deepwood. 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 Yeah. Well, Deepwood, Deepwood is, is, yeah, that's off a of glade. But uh, so you're you're counting Fox Mill Woods, which is an RA. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you have much right. more well, and then real knowledge of what's in and what's yeah. out. But I'm just yeah. And then there's Stratton the, Woods and everything. The, the Whether that, these that, are that. technically Reston, these are Reston neighborhoods. They travel on our streets. They go to our schools. They shop in our stores. Uh, they use our parks. They may not go to our schools. They may go, but I know the ones that. So my point is. You're, when it's convenient, you're limited, and when it's not, you're like, okay, let's like look at this more carefully, and that's yeah, a little. Tammy, bit the planner in me is just trying to get as accurate as I can. I, I and, understand, and we beyond, are too. And to be honest with you, you know, we could say a greater Reston, but but I have trouble pulling that boundary together. I, um, the same so way, the same way that I've said, the transit station area for Reston includes Woodland Park. Now, Woodland Park has never been considered a yeah. part of Reston. Now, if you include it in your numbers, it's going to add thousands of units to your total. Which, which, so that's all I want to do is come up with. Right. Sure. I respect let's, that. Let's, I respect let's, that. Let's decide, on the, let's start, decide on the geography. Let's decide on the methodology. And once we apply it, then, then we'll come up yeah, with it. We agree with that. So let me just, uh, two points. One, in terms of the accuracy, uh, I recognize that. But I just wanted a data point. The, the data point, I, I, I considered that, but the data point that you provided to us, the census population and the zoning ordinance formula population, um, in, in your letter to us, to the RA last year, the ratio was 96.1 to 1. So my point is that the formula population was gave a higher number than the what, what we call the census population. So there is, I, we're recognizing the distinction, but it's not, at least in the example, the only example that, that we have provided so thus far, it, it wasn't drastic. I think the main point that we're looking for, I think as a community coming out of this, one was we want to get to a number in that we agree is, is based on ac an accurate count. We would like that count, we would like a reasonable number to be in the plan. We can talk about what language we use for that. And I, I think we believe that that number is going to, is at present, if we calculated it based on, at least on the zoning recommendations, is beyond that which the community can support even in 25 to 30 years. And that what we were, what we want to understand is once we get, an, we can calculate the number, but we still have to come to some understanding is, did we over commit in our plan for RESTIT in, in the master plan, the densities? Because when you build them out and and again, the numbers that on the build out for the PRC, the 103,000, is based, was you provided it to us. So um, the 44,000 units and taking out the overlap is not a hard mathematical, it, it's still, whether we're saying the number is 175 or 165 or 195, it's still almost two and a half to three, at least three times what we understood the present population to be. And from a planning purposes, for planning purposes, we think that will, is, will facilitate activity um, over this 25 year period that we, we will not be able to sustain the infrastructure for, um, even with good planning. Well, why don't we, why don't we fo focus on it? And, <clears throat> and again, um, I think it is primarily a technical exercise. And let's come up with the number. I don't think the number is going to be 195,000. Um, is it 120? I don't know. Is it 130, 140? Um, back of the envelope would suggest that it's probably somewhere 
in the neighborhood. If there are 44,000 units that were assumed with the transit station area, um, and again, if you double that population, that would be 88,000, and you added that to the existing population of residents, and it, it, again, you're to about 130,000. And again, and we know that there's some significant overlap in the town center where there's a lot of units. So again, I, I don't, again, I, I don't, but I'm, I'm willing to kind of sit down and work through and, and, and maybe be convinced that it is 190, 170, and if so, we'll look at that in terms of what we, Thank you what so we assume, much. but. Yeah, and, and, and I point out when we do the back of the envelope, we have to conclude those 14,000 units that are part of the plan for additional units in the PRC. So, um, yeah. So, we're, but we're with you. On, we're with you on that, and I think that's a, a good step forward to, to work on what is the number that comes out of the plan. What is a good number for um, perhaps our, our target or cap in the plan? And we're happy to work with you on that. Any other discussion on that? Well, I appreciate that. the The next topic on our agenda with the village centers, and. Um, uh, again, some of our background, um, again, the RA had proposed that they would like a clear statement that the village centers, other than Lake Ann and Tall Oak, are currently planned to reflect only land uses that are there today and redevelopment should be considered only in the context of a amendment to the rest of the master plan. And you've touched on that uh, at one point in, in terms of the planning. Uh, CPR recommended um, that there be a medium density um, limitation of 21 to 31 units per acre in, uh, in the mixed use areas of the village centers while sustaining the existing housing in the residential areas. And we recommended the public plazas comprise at least 25% of the total surface area, area. I need to recognize that the CPR view is not universally agreed to by the community. We've had conversations with community. And, and I, I'm acknowledging, so there's, I don't, I don't want to feel, uh, others to feel that they weren't represented, um, that there are those who oppose other than the existing density and surface parking for the village centers. However, it, it was CPR's view that we wanted to recommend a level that would support reasonable, uh, in terms of financially reasonable redevelopment um, that, did, that was consistent with the overall scale of the existing and surrounding neighborhoods. Um, just to finish this background, um, we understood your response that, um, and you cited it earlier, that, that um, not in favor of an, an amendment to the rest of the master plan, but to focus on the uh, development plan for um, is adequate for addressing the village center redevelopment. Um, it was pointed out as to CPR's recommendations that the, the county um, has supports the continues to support a high density for the village centers, and because and and the term the phrase was they've long had this density designation, and that their quote is little justification to provide to support revising it other than maintaining that there is more reflective of neighborhood scale. And the county also was not in favor of the CPR's recommendation regarding the public plazas. Um, so that's, I wanted to kind of get everything out on the, the table, what we've exchanged. I, I, I'm just trying to be fairly representative of what, where I think we have been on, uh, as a, from purposes of discussion, on the village centers. Um, uh, did you want to address the village centers, Larry? Yes. Fred, earlier in your, remarks, you said that the county's already looked at refining those numbers in some way, shape, or form. Could you elaborate on that for us? Okay. Well, what we did was, if you, looked in the, if you look in the comprehensive plan, there are maps of the village centers. And those maps show um, for each village center the area that is the area that is existing residential and the existing non-residential area. When we first generated um, the development potential, we used the entire acreage of the village center. Um, 
that was not, the intent was not that the entire area would redevelop. Particularly, area, I mean, areas like North Point, where there's, there's stable residential communities, what I would call behind the North Point shopping center. Then there was never any intention in the comp plan that that area would somehow be torn down and redeveloped. And quite frankly, I think it would be difficult for anybody to be able to bring in those landowners as a part of any kind of redevelopment scheme to pull density off of it. So I think it's reasonable interpretation of the plan that the plan was really meant to focus on the non-residential areas, which are pr principally shopping centers and parking lots. We also pulled out, because of some of the village centers cross major roadways, like South, uh, South Lakes picks up, I think, a residential uh, on the other side of the street, and Hunter's Woods actually picks up a restaurant that's on the other side of, uh, I guess that's Coast Neck. We pulled out the right of way from there. So we, in essence, reduced the acreage down to what we thought was the, um, I'll call it a more refined estimate. And Kathy, do you have the, uh, it dropped it by about 800 units. Yeah. 884 units, I think, total. In the aggregate number? In the, in the yeah. aggregate, for those yeah. three, yeah. for those three for centers. Those three. Again, we're viewing Lake Ann as being oh, been yeah. approved. Uh, Tall Oaks is going through a process now, so we, we weren't trying to, to deal with either Tall Oaks or Lake Ann. But for the other three, um, it reduces the number of units for those. It takes it from a potential from 3145 down to 2279, or it's 886 units, which again, we think is a more uh, refined and reasonable potential and again, this is a potential number. That doesn't, it doesn't mandate it, um, and it doesn't mean that they can achieve that. Um, also, the question about plazas, the, the plan already speaks to plazas. I, I remember that was one of Bob Simon's comments at the public hearing about how the village centers, he wanted them to be more of a gathering place and the importance of plazas. So I think we try, based on his, we, we added in additional guidance that dealt with plazas and their importance. Um, but again, these areas, if somebody were to come in with a plan for these areas, um, my view is it would be subject to the same degree of scrutiny that the Lake Ann plan was, which went through a lot of back and forth and ultimately had a lot of community support for it. Um, I can tell you, it doesn't surprise me that you, you're hearing different things because one of the things that we heard every time we had a community meeting on the village centers, we heard a range of opinions from the community, everything from don't do anything, I like it just the way it is, to it's not functioning and it hasn't functioned and, it, and we want it to be better than it is today. Now what better is it's yeah, still so open general. to interpretation, <laughs> but there, there were a range of opinions. So it, it doesn't surprise me that when you go back and talk to people in the community, that there are people who say, well, 30 DUs is the answer, or zero DUs is the answer. Um, but again, we're, we're, we are certainly willing to support clarifying the plan to be more explicit with regard to the area that would be subject to the, the density. And, and again, to give you a more refined number, uh, that's something on the order of 2,200 units rather than the 3,100 units. So. If, if I may explore one specific case with you, and, and I, I take my numbers, uh, Leslie, from your mm -hmm. letter to the, the right. spreadsheet on your August 28, 2017 right. letter. So, and I did my own little spreadsheet on it, but um, so I want to talk about North Point Village Center. So, uh, Leslie's spreadsheet noted a plan increase of residential units from its current 154 up to a possible 12, 1,212. One, 1, those would be additional. Additional. So, right. Well, no, that, right. that would be the total. Uh, 
The uh, total, that's the additional. That's right. the additional. The additional, so it's that's one, right. plus I, 154, I, it gets you the 13. So it's, yeah, it's, it's really a, I put that wrong. So 154 plus 1212, 12, which gives us 1366. Right. That represents a 687% increase in <laughs> residential units on uh, North Point Village Center. Now my question is, it seems very unclear how North Point Village Center could accommodate such a residential increase and maintain its current community serving businesses and the parking required for both the businesses and the new residential uh, units. It's, it's hard, so, and, and these numbers were used to generate the new limit, proposed upper limit of 16 persons per acre. So if, the, if, if that is how these were, this is just one case study. There are many different um, um, parcels or areas of Reston that were uh, quantified in this way. But if North Point Village Center is, is representative of how the rest was done, it seems that the number of new allowable or indeed planned units under the comprehensive plan are that large, um, it, it's really unthinkable. I mean, how could you, how could you have a 687% increase uh, on, on uh, North Point Village Center, you know, up to uh, from one, 154 units to well, 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 let, well, let, let me back up, and, 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 and maybe this is where, where there's a difference in perspective. The village centers have, for decades, been planned as high-density residential at up to 50 DUs per acre. So that 13, that didn't come from us. That's been there. I understand. What we did is we didn't take it down. In the process, we left the village centers with the designation of high density residential and 50 DUs per acre. What we're saying is we can talk about the area or acreage that that 50 DUs per acre, and again, that's potential. It doesn't mean that that can be achieved. It doesn't mean that that's what's desired by the community. It doesn't mean any of that. It's just what is the potential growth that's in the village centers? And we left it where it had been for decades. Other areas that had high density designations, we changed them. We took them down because they'd been built. Now, we could have in the village center process, if, if the prevailing wisdom had been don't do a thing to the village centers, if everybody had unanimity on don't do a thing to the village centers, we could have said, OK, there's no redevelopment potential for the village centers. They are what they are. But that isn't what we heard from the community. We heard different voices, but some of those voices said, leave redevelopment potential for the village centers. And quite frankly, we left them where they were. We didn't try to figure out whether 50 was the number, or 40, or 30, or 20, because there were no development plans for, for North Point, South Lakes, Hunters Woods. There was nobody there as there was somebody there for Tall Oaks saying what they wanted to do and, and had concepts and you could look at it and... and you know, right, as you know, I mean, a lot of people, it's when the wolf is at the door is, is when people pay attention. Uh, and so to say that the community yeah, supported exactly. putting 1,300 people into no. uh, North Point is, is no. ridiculous. No. I, I live in North Point and, and, you know, this is the first time hearing of this. What I'm saying is what, what, I, what we did was not change it. Okay? All right, I that's, that. that's different. I understand. Inaction, well, we inaction is, is different from inaction. And I understand why you did it, Fred. My, my, my concerns are twofold. The first is to, because I live right across the street from North Point, I can, ima I can, imagine, I can imagine what would happen if, uh, if, we, if we went to 13,000 and change. 1,300 and change. I'm sorry. Thirteen hundred and change. Uh, so it, it's 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 the it's the very concrete imagining of what that would look like and what would happen to the businesses there and the parking, which is already strained. 
but the second concern is that you, these numbers were used to come up with the 16 person per acre cap. So it, it, it is off both in the yeah. concrete and in the proposed cap. So those are two, two concerns that I have with it. And then also, this kind of density doesn't follow the master plan or the comp plan saying that the village centers have to blend with their neighborhoods. And so that's a distinct contradiction within the plan. If you're coming up with these kinds of numbers, there's no way that's blending with the, the neighborhood. Existing neighborhood that you're not suggesting be changed. And this is, you know, this isn't a theoretical thing to us. This is our reality. And we need those village centers provide day-to-day -day services that we all need. We need to be able to get to them, and we need, we need that they are not like, holy smokes, what's happening here? We need that. We have a different situation in the Reston Town Center. We have a different situation in the TSA areas. We get that. We're not fighting that. But we're like, whoa, the village centers and this kind of approach is unacceptable. I will say now, I don't. It, whoever did it, whenever they did it, it's not acceptable anymore. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to emphasize that the notion of it, that's the way it has been in the plan is um, not, the, from my perspective, not the best argument that can be made. Then, then because among other things, what we've learned together is that redevelopment in existing neighborhoods is really challenging. And that the way it was when they were built didn't, was not at a point where all this neighborhoods had grown together with them. So from the perspective of the rationale and the concerns of the citizens, what CPR said, having an opportunity for viable redevelopment um, makes sense to us at a scale that's consistent with the neighborhoods. And that's what we're, that's the position that we've kind of urged. We're not a no growth no. position. We're not a no change position. But we are recognizing that w the way it was in the original planning for Reston has to consider the what has happened since in terms of the existing neighborhoods. Um, and that, that's where um, we were still looking for some opportunity to bring those that de the intensity down there, and we think it, it's a natural place to look when we start talking about the overall population. Because if we think the intensity should be where the the benefits of the Silver Line are, that does not include certainly doesn't include North Point uh, and and the and the other village centers. So from that perspective, we think. We, can, we have to look at it today, how it's built, and the real desire of the community to take advantage of the Silver Line where it makes sense and not to commit the existing neighborhoods to something that now that they're built, um, th that level of high density does not match. Bruce? Sure. Yes, yes. Um, you took out the 864 units. When you do that, um, is that lost in the rounding, or does it still go from 13 to 16, or does it now go from 13 to 14? Or, you know, in terms of making that work, now that you've taken out those units, it, does the 16? What what happens to the numbers? All right. Um, I, I don't have yeah. the Leslie's spreadsheet well, in front of me. Yeah, we wanted to get into that. I, I don't know if now's the best time to do okay. that, or you and, want to do that after. Why don't we do it after neighborhood issues? Because I think what we'd like to do is, is to kind of circle back to. I mean, this started with the PRC amendment and the density, and <coughs> like the problem. Uh, uh, we're we're, we're in agreement with that, that Fred. Those units were going, and I'm wondering how does that affect the numbers? We we yeah. we yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we we've done a lot of calculations. Right, um, so can we can we sure. maybe? <laughs> 
neighborhood issues, again, the St. John's Woods and golf courses, I tried to touch on at least those in terms of how the plan treats both areas and why. Um, but I'd be... Could, could, uh, for, yeah, I, what I've tried to do in each of these is give the background that what we've exchanged. I think in our letter to Supervisor Hudgens, CPR recommended the deletion of the special conditions in the rest and master plan to allow a higher density for St. John's Wood. We're now talking about two, I'm sorry, two neighborhood issues. St. John Wood and the road to nowhere, from, from, nowhere, from nowhere to nowhere. Um, <laughs> um, that cursed road that you just can't get rid of. It, for those of you yeah. into transportation, but you're racing it at parks and <laughs> For those that are not familiar with well, well, we didn't want to beat a dead uh, horse yeah. too much. transportation paper, Fred. We just okay. didn't yeah. talk about it. Okay. Uh, just for the, the benefit of those who are observing, perhaps uh, without the familiar, familiarity, the St. John's Woods property has a, is a now a 250-unit um, garden-style apartment in North um, Reston at the corner of Reston Parkway and Harbor. Center Harbor. Center Harbor. And it is some two to three miles from a, a transit station, from a, from a metro station. Um, the rest of master plan authorizes a higher density day there that would, under certain conditions, that would allow the density to double, at least double there. Um, the under, under those conditions. And when we, re well, the response that we received was, and you've enunciated it tonight, Fred, that the property, property previously was designated high density, an argument that I told you is problematic for us in an existing neighborhood, and that the property owner's nomination was um, submitted and in some level was part of the uh, give and take for the rest of the master plan. I will say that the CPR has closely examined through Freedom of Information Act uh, the emails and staff exchanges with the council for the developer. And without going into the great detail or suggesting any improprietary, it's evident to us that to, in an animal farm settings, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. The, Developer enjoyed significant access to staff and officials, including the opportunity, literally, to edit the exact language that was put into the Reston Master Plan for its own property. The public had no input on that draft language. It did not appear in the county staff report in April 15, eight, April 20, 2015, and it's not in the version of the Reston Master Plan that, were, that was reviewed in the Planning Commission public hearing on the Phase Two study. So those are, that's the setting. But more, most, more substantively, we believe there's no rational basis for a special density condition in that location for a property far from the metro, surrounded by stable, low-density residential properties. Um, we understand that historically it was that, but we also understand that for every place else, almost every place else, the planned as built philosophy was adopted by the staff and only late in the game, after the, pub, the, the, the study, did this um, condition that permits this density increase come into fruition. Okay. So that, that, that's in a nutshell where uh, at least CPR is on, on uh, Let me clarify, John's wood. clarify one point just to Fairfax County has a long history of amending its comprehensive plan to what's called, what started out as calling an area plan, sort of area plan review process, or APR, and where we periodically solicit nominations to change the comprehensive plan from anybody in the community. Uh, Reston has not had many of those cycles uh, because Reston being PRC, it just doesn't have the flexibility that other parts of the county have with more conventional zoning to change the plan as it relates to their property. That APR process is nomination driven. 
we have an open window when people submit a nomination for the change, it's reviewed, and it's then acted upon. It can be denied, it can be accepted, it can be accepted in part. But one of the features of that nomination process is that the nominator says what they want to do with their property. And that's what happened with St. John's Woods. So it was not out of the ordinary for the nominator or the property owner or their representative to suggest what the plan, what they wanted the plan language to be, because staff is not in the role of saying, we will tell you what to do with it. We're just there to evaluate it. So what happened was not out of the ordinary. Again, it may be unfamiliar to Reston, but when we've done APR nominations in other parts of the county, and those nominations come in, we ask for as much specificity as we can because we, we're not in the, in, the, in the role of putting forward what the plan language should be. That being said, once it starts going through the process, if we see something, we can say, well, why don't you change this or modify that? It would be clearer if you said this. So we try to work with them to get it into language that can fit in the comprehensive plan and is clear. But in terms of the substance, that's on them. And these conditions, they came from the, and, and quite honestly, uh, that was what they thought they needed to do to get community support for it. Oh. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, I can, but I'm just saying that's the process that we went through. And for Reston, as we did in Tyson's, as we did other places, what we say is we want to have, give everybody an opportunity to, to recommend a change to the plan. And we received that nomination and we processed it accordingly. It, 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 I, I understand the process. I also understood that more details that we need to discuss tonight. My, one of the, my questions is, again, why should we increase the density in a well-established neighborhood outside the village centers and the TSAs? You know, I, I simply I can, because the owner requested. I, again, I I cannot, I can't go back and say every element of why did you do this on that element. This this plan is what 100 and some 140 pages. I can't go back through and say this change. It's a process that we went through, and I would defy anybody to say that this wasn't this this language was out there, and we put the plan language out for months and had people call, can, could comment on it. We put it online. We put a draft online, and that online for months. It's one of the first times we've ever and, done and that. And based on their development application that they've submitted, which they have, I think we're not at 50 DUs per acre. They're at, what, 30, 35, 36? Right. I mean, they've reduced it several yeah. times based on that dialogue between the community. So, you know, we're, we're we're kind of at that point Again, right now. The, the, the recommendations for rest of the neighborhoods, if you go back and look at them, some of them are carryovers from the old plan. Some of them came from the, the landowner, the nominator. That's what happened for St. John's Woods. The others that came up as a part of the public hearing testimony, the, can't think, it's the um, historic house, that there were any number of people who came out for and and said that that property should be preserved. It has a. I'm sure I can find it here. Yeah, talk about the Bowman. Fairfax Hunt Club property, and that that property came out, and people said, "Yes, we realize it has conventional zoning. It's not zoned PRC. It's a, I think it's a five-acre site. They recognized that there should be some redevelopment of it, but they came out and talked about." preserving that house as a part of the process. And that language was put in as a result of, again, community comment. So, you know, again, we do our best to reflect what we think are the, the process, which is one of it's interactive. And everybody has a, has a role in it. And property owners have a role in it. The surrounding community, who, most of whom are property owners, some can be runners, they have a role in it. The business community has a role in it. The broader Fairfax County community has a role in it. Go ahead. So 
again, as with um, North Point Village Center, so here with St. John Woods, there are two aspects, two problems w that I have with this. Bruce has already talked well about one problem, which is the inappropriateness of something this size on that property. I want to address, again, the second issue, which has a bearing on how, we came, how the county came to propose a increase in the cap up to 16 persons per acre. So the current development is 250. The county said there are there there is planned residential growth of an additional 465 units creating a total of 715 units. Now that is nearly triple the current size. Yet the Rest and Association Design Review Board, which does have jurisdiction in this matter, limited but real, has told the St. John's Woods developer that their proposal of 481 units, not 715, but 481, and their later proposal of 441 units, again, far from the 715, were too massive to be consistent with the rest and master plan. So if these unrealistic numbers are part of the formula for deriving the 16 person per acre cap proposal, it's off. So there are two instances, I believe, the, the uh, North Point Village Center and St. John's Woods where erroneously inflated numbers were used to arrive at the calculation of a need for 16 persons per acre as the cap. Well, well, I don't think they're erroneous. I think we just based it on the, the max potential, which is what we were trying to, okay, what, you know, on the spectrum, 50 DUs per acre times the acreage, you get the number of units, you have what was already counted plus the addition, and that's, that's where we came up with uh, I you know, understand how you did it. Right, right, or, right or wrong, it's, but they're not erroneous. They're just, right. well, you know, you're talking about, you know, the, the max potential when we were talking about something over, you know, a 50-year period. But you are telling us, and Fred very graciously told us, that this, these are max projections and we don't expect them to ever be, but then why do we have to change the cap now? This is a huge problem. This only encourages, number one, you change a cap. That is only telling a developer if you press hard enough, at some point, you can raise it again. That's number one. And number two, I think we've pointed out that the figures we're coming up with are monks scream. There's no way we can accommodate without the cap raised what we are facing, whether it's built or not, we don't know, but they're getting permission to build it. The zoning is there. Every time I look at the Board of Supervisors, there's another zoning change being suggested, proposed, or voted in. And this is all post-Reston being a, our master plan, our comprehensive plan being approved. So, you know, th there's a huge concern of what's happening. And once those zoning things are passed, the Board of Supervisors now, if they can't be rescinded because we're at Dillon State and all this other stuff and you can't redo zoning, what choice is this Board of Supervisors that's passing all these changes given to the future if and when needs change and we need to ratchet that down? Um, you're, you're, there's the assumption that it's always going to go up. Well, we're telling you we have limited real estate. We can't put in more roads. We can't put in more fields. We can't put in more schools because we can't afford the land, so we're going to put them in high rises. If we can afford to buy the high rises, you see the point that at this point, we can't get across town 
Now we hope that when the second phase of the, the um, subway goes away, that those people won't all be coming in here. We don't know. As you said, you have to wait a while to see what the result is. Well, I don't, you know, other than this, this flux of, of traffic in for with the Wheelie Station, which can't accom com it just can't accom it can't accommodate all of what can't explain everything that's coming in. We're gridlocked now, so we're saying we live here. There's sixty thousand of us. We pay our taxes. We support you. We work and we say, Fred, you know, we have a relationship that goes back. And I'm testifying. And I honestly adore you. But I also want to strangle you. And I don't know if one is feeling really neutral. I don't know if one is where complaints have been have resulted in any change. And that's been my mantra. We can, you can have all of the, the hearings, but if the citizens are at some point, Hunt Club, that is the one thing. Can you think of other citizen concerns in Reston where things have been drawn back from what they were planned for because you heard this massive citizen protest? Well, St. John's Wood is part <laughs> of it. I mean, you know, it started out at 50 yeah, and well, now they're down to, you know. Yeah. And it's that, and that's, and, and I, and thank you. I mean, so, I mean, but I mean, the amount of effort that's going into this, over and over, project by project by project, we need as a community not to be. Hopefully, they're coming again with something. There's this project and this. We want some help from the people that we trust to plan for us. That hey, wait a minute, maybe we better reconsider. I wanted to emphasize that we could spend yeah. <laughs> a project, yeah. and, and I, it, obviously you understand the deep sense of um, commitment by the community to getting this right. And St. John's Wood is an example where the community stood up. I, I would only say that one of the goals of working on the Rest and Master Plan was that we don't have to have citizen soldiers <coughs> fighting every project. Or projects that seem out of um, out of whack, we are not going to resolve. It's what I'm. What I draw from this is is that um, we're where we were when we started on St. John's Wood. Well, but but I, but but I think the process works. But what I'm he I'm hearing is, you know, we have these fears and concerns, but I'm also hearing that the process works in, in the context of. You said, well, what is the what is the right context for North Point? Should it be developed? I don't know. There's no development plan out there. And I trust the process that says if somebody comes in, the plan, the comp plan says, if you're going to come in with a redevelopment plan, you have to work first work with your neighbors. Now, it could be the people around there today. It could be 15 years from now, which means there will be another set of neighbors who will have a different view of what is the right context or what is not the right context or whether this is overwhelming or not overwhelming. Again, uh, you know, people could suggest 30 DUs per acre is the answer. I don't know that. But, I can, but, but, but the plan provides op options and opportunities. That's what the plan provides. It's an opportunity for somebody to come in with a redevelopment plan. It doesn't guarantee them 50 DUs per acre. It says, you do all of these great things. I can tell you, when Bob Simon came out talking about the village centers, he saw them as high-rise developments around the plaza. And that, again, that's what he said, because he said you needed that kind of density there to have people to form it as a gathering place. Right now, most people would suggest that the village centers are operating as shopping centers. Now, for those who love shopping centers, they're happy. But for those who see something, who want something more, or something perhaps better than a shopping center, then that's an option and an opportunity. And to be candid with you, the retail sector 
who knows what's going to happen in the next five to ten years. So while the shopping centers may be okay now, I mean, we had people who come in and were saying that uh, Tall Oaks was a functioning shopping center. <laughs> and I can tell you, having seen decades of empty, you know, Burger King or whatever the heck was, that's gone, the grocery store is gone, three or four iterations, it, it was, right. It, it really was not a functioning <laughs> center, but that didn't keep people from coming out saying, oh, but why not a Trader Joe's, or why not this, or why not that? So at some point, again, while it may be challenging as to how you redevelop these areas, it may be a viable option when you have disinvestment in, in an area. And again, Fairfax County has been very fortunate as to not have disinvestment as a problem. But communities have disinvestment as a problem. They do anything in the world to, to get what we get through our processes. Because again, disinvestment takes everybody down. Because again, it's abandoned, it's dragging on property values, it becomes a nuisance. And there are any number of things that happen when you see disinvestment. The good news is we, have, we don't see it. And I don't suspect that we will. I need to move to our final topic. I just wanted to acknowledge that in our communications, and we talked about the 50 DU um, acre. We're going to touch on that. We're going to touch on the, that 50, the, the, the recommended. For the, other, for the transit station areas. Are you talking about the single site? Well, I was really talking about the, that I, where a point of where I thought we had agreement um, was on the 50 plus Oh, yes. Category. Yes. So yeah. um, just to make sure that we are all, right. there are some points we definitely yeah. agree on, and that's that, one that where we. That category was not meant to be an unlimited category. It was only applied, I think, to two sites. Uh, one site was trying to reflect uh, the Harrison, which is actually built. Mm -hmm. But the Harrison was a part of, I guess it's Park Reston or whatever, it used right. to have another name. That entire development never exceeded the 50. What they did was pull transfer density off of the existing portion of that park rest and that remained. They redeveloped a portion, and, and you had the Harrison. Uh, and I think we were trying to accommodate uh, Charter Oaks because there was a concept when we were doing the comp plan, there was a concept for Charter Oaks that was to do something similar, retain most of the units, but redevelop a small portion of the site, and that redevelopment portion would be above 50 DUs per acre. But it was never meant to be unlimited. And I think we can clarify in the plan that that's what we intended and that's what it was meant to do, that it wasn't opening up some new category of unlimited uh, density. And that, just to summarize, was one of the things we, we hope to just make sure we we're all on the same page. I'm sorry, Dennis. On, uh, Let's go. Uh, very, very quickly, very quickly on, uh, on the uh, road from nowhere. Uh, we've talked about this in other settings. Anyone who doesn't know, this is the connector between Isaac Newton and, and American Dream Way that impacts both the WOD and the Hidden Creek Golf Course. Uh, as you know, we have asked repeatedly, how did it get there? No one knows. We asked, who put it there? No one knows. Uh, it appeared miraculously in the middle of the night on an appendix, uh, a small wiggly line, line uh, and, and there's been no justification for it. So giving you the benefit of the doubt, uh, I think our position is, is clearly this is an error. Uh, and we talked earlier about correction of errors. And so what we would like to get rid of this so we'd never have to talk about it again is, is that we correct this error and get it off of, of these maps. Now. If, in fact, it is not an error, if, in fact, the county deliberately put it there and is intent on keeping it there, then I would ask you to answer all those questions. Who put it there? Why was it put there? And what purpose does it serve? Because right now, it's nothing but an irritant. So, Fred, if we can get rid of this, as I said, we never have to talk about it again. <laughs> this is where you yeah. say, good idea. Question. Question. <laughs> I'll have to say the question is accepted. It, it really is a transportation figure. And um, uh, we've articulated why we think it's a good idea on a conceptual plan to have it, but we'll certainly go back and take a look at it. I'll just note that it does appear in the uh, newly released 
the new released um, net rest and network analysis final report of March 28th of this year. So the the road to He's nowhere does up. does appear uh, in Figure 9.1 of, of that report. Are, are they just are they just reproducing the figure that's in the comp plan? Or it, the, it, 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 it is it, it is the same figure, okay. but more refined yeah. because it defines the grade of street which it is. Hmm. Okay. Good. Any, anything else on that point? Um, we owe, owe the public. Well, some don't we want to hear I, from well, Fred Scott hear, well, um, about sorry. the golf course and or how did you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's circle back to the numbers. Yeah, we're, we can go over. Okay. This is. No, 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 no. We're we're our time can go over. I'm saying we're not going to end at eight. No. That's exactly what I'm talking about. You should have another meeting. You have another hour on your agenda. No. Can we have another meeting, Fred? We'd love another I, meeting. I don't think we have another uh, I mean, hour. We should have another meeting to talk about this. Some of us haven't been home for dinner yet. Some of us have to be up early in the morning to go well, to tomorrow. I, so what, I, what I'd like to do is... All I'm saying is when I was at this meeting last week, we stopped our discussion and allowed people in the audience to talk. Okay. If we want to stop the discussion now, what I'd like to do is take two minutes. We, the question was asked, how does, how does some of the changes affect the numbers? We'll hand that out, and people can certainly take it away and, and digest it and react to it, and then we can open it up for public comment. What I would suggest, though, is Laurie Stone was gracious enough to come. If you'd like her to provide you a brief written response, we can do that with the, with the response from the police and answer those questions for you. Response? Yeah, that, I believe, I can't speak for everyone, but that was, makes a lot of sense on the circumstances and it will give time to the public okay. to have their questions. Sorry, Lori, but thank you for that. Thank you. Enjoy this conversation. Very <laughs> much so. <laughs> yeah, she bought the booby rights. That's funny, these are all. You want to hand them out? Yeah, we'll hand it. Yeah. And this will be sent to us electronically. I just so want to make sure you all have it. it. Yeah, we have. We can send it to you. So can we proceed? If we're in agreement. We're going to proceed to our uh, audience questions. Uh, as we, as you notice, we have two minutes per person, and we welcome audience questions. And please come up to the mic. I, I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity. Yourself? I'm Stuart Gibson. I live at 11339 Orchard Lane. I'm a resident newcomer. I've only lived here since 1984. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to have the discussion. And one of the things that Fred pointed out was that a lot of these changes have been gone through without any objection. And I kind of feel like this is the story of the frog in the pot of water. And we're finally getting toward the boiling point. The frog is realizing that we're all going to cook. When I hear 44,000 dwelling units in the transit corridor, by the way, I read 62,000 and 88,000 is 150,000, not 130,000. So we're talking about more than doubling the number of people who live here now. So having made that point, having felt like the frog now, uh, I, I go back to one thing, and, and, I, and I'll, do, I'll end with this. I'm a cubby guy. I think you begin with the end in mind. And the question is, what's the end in mind? Is the end in mind to have as many people as we can cram into the space that we live in, living here, or is the end in mind the idea that we want to maintain or improve the quality of life for people who live in Reston? I actually believe it's the latter, not the former. And if having more people live here improves the quality of life, so be it. And that's a good thing. But having more people living here just for the sake of having more people living here is not an end that I think is worthy of even discussion, let alone approving. And I think as these discussions move forward, these, we need to be able to identify what it is our goal is 
Because if we don't know where we're going, when we get there, we may be in the wrong place. Thank you. Please. I'm sorry. John. I, I, I miss. Uh, hi, I'm Walt Culver. I live in uh, Mallard's Landing. Uh, and uh, when March 6th came and the current comprehensive plan was published, it's 184 pages, I got it almost immediately downloaded. <clears throat> and it turned out it was three weeks before we had our annual meeting for Mallard's Landing. We're a group of 48 townhouses. <clears throat> I went through the plan and came up with about five pages of notes. I actually read pretty much every page and presented to the uh, Mallard's Landing Board and the homeowners, and a great deal of concern was raised. Uh, they asked me, what can we do about it? I said, well, you know, we, we obviously as, as citizens, we can uh, uh, you know, affect our opinions on this. They said, well, why don't you go out, and at least in South Reston, and try to get other boards, other condominium boards, other townhouse boards, uh, together and figure out what they say about it. So I began doing that and uh, got the uh, addresses from a Reston Association and to the extent that they were accurate. I've now, can, in a sense, say I can speak for 1,563 households. What I did, based on running businesses, I said rather than just talking about this stuff, let's put it down in writing. So I put together a two-page letter to be sent to Secretary to uh, Supervisor Hudgens, with the boards interacting with me to say, what should this letter say? Uh, I can send it at your convenience. I'm still collecting additional people who are signing on to it. But I can send it out in the next week or two, whatever is convenient. The message is this. A, the people say the plan is well done. And in the on the very first page, it said village centers are very important to us. And the resident friendliness of the village centers is key to the entirety of our way of life. We like that. Everybody liked that. The second thing is the chart we've been talking about, which reflects, at least for South Reston, uh, the fact that uh, South Lakes Village Center is due to grow per this. Uh, and this was back in uh, late last year by a factor of 4.1 to 1. And uh, Hunter's Wood is supposed to grow by 3.4 to 1. How that can be done and maintain uh, resident friendliness is what's concerning to the people who signed on this letter. The recommendation that we're writing up, which and we're not county planners or, or city planners, but basically what it says is, currently in the plan on page 64 for each of the village centers, it says, currently there's no redevelopment plan for this village center. That's a little bit too wide open for us. What we are suggesting to be done is a general framework be put together that allows growth and without defining, we're not in the business of saying whether it ought to be 16 people per acre or 15 people per acre, whatever. Whatever the growth is. Uh, it should, unless otherwise modified, it should reflect the land uses that exist there today. If there's going to be significant building height or mass added commercial intensity or parking intensity, that it should require a new amendment to the plan predicated on both property owner participation and substantial agreement of community residents in a public meeting. That's what the letter is going to say. Again, we're, I, I see that there are some changes that have just been handed out tonight. Uh, that's not reflected in the letter. And, and it it it's not, makes no sense to try to rewrite the letter to reflect that. But this represents the, the position, at least as through their community boards, of 1,563 people, 1,563 households, around 4,200 people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. These are two tough acts to follow. Um, I want to identify first with the last thing Stu Gibson said, uh, the notion that this group needs to tell us all where it is you think we ought to be going so we have a better chance of getting there. Uh, but I, I thank you all for this process, because I was at the South Lakes meeting, I don't know, six, eight, ten months ago, whatever it was, 
you've come a long way, baby. You guys, are, you guys have done, spent a lot of time getting down to the issues and having a rational discussion between the community and the folks from the county. I think you've all done an outstanding job. I appreciate the process. I've learned a lot. I learned tonight where St. John's Wood came from. I didn't know that it was part of a legitimate uh, you know, plan process, uh, that it was put up there for authorization. It was authorized. And now it's, it's, not, it's dwindling before our very eyes because the rest and community processes are at play. And that's the way it's supposed to work. I think the outcome might be a good one. But it has legitimacy. It has legitimacy for discussion from that point because it, it got there the right way. Fred corrected me on that tonight. I had only one very small question coming out of the conversation I've heard tonight, and that's village centers and the example raised by Mr. Mooney. North Point, and I heard you say 154 units were going to become 1,360, a 680% increase or something. And then you said some other things that were very important. There's no way that that's sustainable. You don't have enough parking. You couldn't get to it. Da -da 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 -da. And I never heard an answer from the other side. Fred? Is that, is that feasible to have an increase like that at North Point? And can you conceive of, as the, as the excellent planner you are, that we could actually make that sustainable? It sounds on the face of it that Mr. Mooney has a good point. Well, again, without a concept plan, it's hard to say how somebody could redevelop that area. I mean, it's a, it's to that a, extent. It's a sizable area. And again, one of the things that people uh, Things change over time. For example, when that shopping center went in, the only way to economically do it was the surface parking. Now retail areas are, are routinely doing structured parking. And my sense is at some point, they'll do below grade parking or underground parking. If you do underground parking, the FAR goes up significantly and the density can go up significantly to meet a 50 D use per acre because again, the units aren't competing with the parking when you put them on the ground, or you, or you figure out a way to do the parking structures. Um, so that's why it's hard to, to right now say, you know, what it would look like and how you can make it work. But I think the plan is, is very clear that to get to that answer, you'd have a collaborative process between the property owner, the community, and sorting out things like, well, what is the appropriate height? How tall can a building be without looming over the surrounding community? Um, again, those are answers that you could get to once you have a development plan that somebody comes forward with. But right now, nobody that, that I know of is doing that. And without that, it's hard to set the parameters for this area um, with respect to how tall will the building be, how much mass will there be, how much open space will there be? How, what kind of plaza? What kind of gathering place? What might you do differently? Uh, what kind of retail are you trying to accommodate? Uh, we're now seeing grocery stores go into multifamily buildings, which is something that even five years ago you weren't seeing, but I'm almost routinely seeing it happening now. So there is a possibility, and, and quite frankly, the village centers are taken up by the grocery stores. Uh, that's the big space user. And again, they're figuring out ways to work within a, a, a different kind of development that is more mixed use than you have now. And that's all the plan is suggesting, that at, at some point in the future, you may want to consider some kind of mixed use redevelopment, which again will bring, it, it has two benefits. And we I mean, can talk about all the negatives of, you know, but it has two benefits, typically, you integrate the retail within buildings, and it brings in a new residential that typically will be supportive of what kind of retail that you're going to have there. So, you know, one of the things that when you look at our village, the village centers in Reston, a lot of them walled off. I was amazed that, quite frankly, when I looked at a map of North Point, that it included the residential behind it. Because, quite frankly, you would make no connection between the two. It's very hard to define that there's any kind of connection. Because, again, it's no different from a lot of places in Fairfax County where we have a retail center, and behind it we have residential development. Uh, South Lakes is a little bit better, but not much better. I think Hunters Woods probably has more integration than most, but that's because it was one of the first. But, again, you know, there's some opportunities there. And all the plan was trying to do is set up 
a, a, an avenue for some of those opportunities to be explored in the future. It doesn't mandate it. It just provides the opportunity. Thanks. That's, I, I missed that. You left a good a bomb laying out there on the floor. I thought you, you, know, you really threw a, a good, good device there. But it, there's more discussion here that this needs. More discussion to be had. Yeah, Maybe much more. Happens, I appreciate everything you guys have done tonight. And I apologize, by the way, Leslie, for calling it an erroneous calculation. <laughs> no, no, that was really the wrong word. To me, it was an unrealistic calculation. And that's was, what I, 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 that's fair. <laughs> so, um, hi, my name is Lynn Mulston, and I live uh, in the Tall Oaks area uh, on Lynx Drive. And uh, I serve as a director on the Reston Citizens Association, and I also serve as chair of the Rescue Reston North Course Committee. And uh, Fred, I wanted to ask a question uh, when we were discussing village centers um, pertaining to Tall Oaks. Um, you mentioned that Tall Oaks was going through a process now, and I was wondering what that might be. Well, again, there's a, there's a development application that is being pursued for Tall Oaks. I don't know the status of it, but again, that's what I meant by the terms of it. It's being zoning was, the zoning was approved. Right? Yeah, they had a PRC plan approved, yeah. I believe. Okay. Was yeah. Approved, they go okay. Well, I couldn't keep up with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would ask that uh, if things are not going to be moving forward with Tall Oaks, that we please reestablish the original zoning to a tall to a to a village center, it is okay. Okay. So when will we find out the plan? When will the public be alerted to what the new plan? Because I understand that Jag sold to somebody else. When will the public? Still the same plan. It's the same exact plan, a new builder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, my, my second point, I know I have two minutes, no. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, I, I just want to say how much I, I appreciate the progress that we've made with the county and the community, and I want to see that continue. And um, I just want to request respectfully that we not move forward with any change in the density for PRC until we understand where we are, what's in the funnel, and start reconciling where things are before we even try to move forward. But don't, I mean, there's no need to, to move forward at this point. So thank you. A any other questions? Yes, John, I'm sorry. John. Uh, my name is John Farrell. I am the cluster president of uh, Colonial Oaks Cluster, which is uh, kind of right across the street from uh, the uh, rest of the National Golf Course. As many people know here, I've also been practicing land use law in this August community for 33 years, really. Um, <laughs> and I've also been teaching land use law to uh, the State Bar Association. Um, and I agree with several things that Fred said and disagree with a couple, but I'll take off from where we agree. Yes, we have an APR process. And the APR process is an absolutely normal process. Bruce, it's not unusual. Uh, I did APRs all over this county. And by the way, APR stands for Annual Plan Review, or at least it has for most of my 33 years. And that's an important point that I'll come back to. And so it's not at all unusual for a landowner to come in and say to the county, please change the comprehensive plan for mine. It's also not unusual for a landowner to come in for what we call an out of turn plan amendment that is outside the APR process. And the APR process, for those of you not familiar with it, 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 we would frequently cut the county up into quarters, thirds, halves, and half the year we'd be looking at northern Fairfax, and the, other, the next year we'd be looking at southern Fairfax. And even though it was an annual plan review, some of those reviews would go on for you know, five years before the, <laughs> all of the cases that had been applied for had been resolved. But that goes to my point about, that I want to make about plans. We plan, at least when I was in planning, I'm sorry? At least when I was in planning school, we planned not for 50 years, for 20 years. So I keep hearing this, well, 50 years from now, we're going to do something. Think about this. 50 years ago, anybody think of the internet? Yeah. I mean, what are you doing planning for 50 years from now? Nobody knows what everything's going to, but 20 years is hard enough. But the thing I 
really wanted to step up and talk about is, yes, in Virginia, master plans are, in the, in the words of the learner case, by a guy. That's the case law on comprehensive plans, except in Reston. The Reston comprehensive plan is not like any other plan in Fairfax County or in the Commonwealth, because only the Reston plan is specifically incorporated into the zoning ordinance. And if you're not complying with the Reston comprehensive plan, you are violating the zoning ordinance. That's different. And that is intentional, going all the way back to the PRC ordinance, which we used to have. So, and, to, and the other point I want to make is the statute says, our comprehensive plan statute says, we must local government must review the comprehensive plan every five years. Not that we can't review it before five years because we've got the APR process, we've got the out of turn plan amendment process, right? But we have to review the comprehensive plan every five years, which is why a 50 year horizon is foolishness because you've got to go back and look at it every five years. Okay, when did we adopt the rest and plan phase one? How many years has it been since we adopted the phase one of the rest and master plan? Yeah, would it be nice to have some more zoning done? Well, yeah, there was a little thing in the middle called the 2008, you know, real estate implosion. Okay, yeah, okay. So we didn't get the amount or acceleration of speed. But five years is coming up, folks. And let us not ignore the elephant in the room. There's an election next year, right? And we're probably going to have a new supervisor. And this probably ought to be part of the discussion of next year's election. They say, hey, new supervisor, what do you think about this stuff? What do you think about having high rises on South Lakes? What do you think about having high rises at North Point? And, I, and is that supervisor going to have an opportunity to have input if we adopt a PRC ordinance this year or next year? Have we precluded that supervisor? having freedom of action during their new term. And should we be doing that, given the proximity of an election? Those are my thoughts. Thank you. Well said. <laughs> Any other further questions? Thank you, yes. Professor yeah. Farrell. <laughs> uh, I'm Rob Whitfield with the Fairfax <laughs> County Taxpayers Alliance. And I've lived in Fairfax County for 40 years and worked in Reston, and lived in Reston 20 plus years. Um, one thought came to me as I was listening to the village centers. Uh, that, that the village centers are an ideal people, place for the senior citizens of our community to live. And that therefore we should be providing incentives for you know, 100 plus units of senior living proximate to the the, the supermarkets and the other amenities. Of, so I don't have a problem with 50 units per acre of senior citizens housing because obviously the parking requirements and the trip generation is much lower. So, so I, I completely lost track. Fred, does the comprehensive plan for Reston have any section at all about elder accommodation? I'm sure it does, but I'll, I'll look and see. So, not to be honest, enough, but plan. I would like the thinking going forward to encourage, and perhaps the right word is incentivize, location of additional. I mean, there are facilities near. The facilities uh, at most of them now. Huntley, right. What I'm just saying is certainly at North Point, there's an opportunity to build that into the plans and even at the. Uh, what is it called, St. John's Woods. Uh, because in Arlington County, John perhaps can confirm this, there are places where there's, what, 125 <coughs> units per acre? In, in Probably. And, but the thing that makes Arlington different than Reston, the, the transit station areas, Boston to Roslyn, those areas are typically, what, 165 to 200 acres? Max? I, I, I don't know. Rob. Well, that's my memory from a presentation by somebody from the county. So, Fred, is it correct that the, the TSA areas or the 
planned areas in Reston are 1,700 acres. That's the number that's in my head. It's tight. That's, that's the number I've seen, Rob. So but my concern is that's as big as Tyson's Corner. So therefore, any decisions we're making for this community involving such a large land area. When I worked in real estate 20 plus years ago, the FARs in uh, the I, whatever it was, I3, I4, I5, I don't remember, development was typically at 0.3 to 0.5 FAR. Uh, and then maybe in the last 20 years, it, it, as structured parking started in, land values maybe permitted it. We got maybe higher than 0.5 FAR, but, except, of course, the town center, which already, already had unlimited development. So my con con concluding concern is land use and transportation have operated on separate tracks. And here we have, tomorrow, the board is considering the, was it the Rest and Crescent project. I have zero idea of what transportation proffers. Uh, I know this much from Mark Looney that when office development reaches three and a half million in town center, is when the next lane of Reston Parkway has to be built. But <laughs> I guess the totality of what's within a mile of town center, I have no damn idea of the time frame of any of the improvements, including those mentioned by Tom Bashadney at a meeting here a couple of weeks ago. And so this is a big problem. Uh, until we have some assurance on the time frame and funding for the transportation, development in Reston should be predicated on a phasing plan, which I think was done for Tyson's. That may be used what was amended in 2017. Because right now, as things stand, we're all screwed. If, if we get 8 million square feet of new development in, in town center area, 6 o'clock at night, try going south on, on Reston Parkway. It's a mess. So. I do thank you for much better communication clarity tonight. That, first, that meeting with Tom three weeks ago on transportation, I couldn't hear a word. And so is, is this available online for review? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Right now? OK. Well, thank you for your, all your work. And I hope we have a follow-up meeting to resolve some of these unresolved issues. Thank you. Last question. Yeah, I'm going to be very short. But you came up with the Census Bureau and their data. I worked for them 30 years. And the one thing that the Bureau does is they can do, conduct numerous studies to see how people react to it, how best to approach people, and how to deal with communities. And what I've found tonight is there seems to be very little lacking in terms of addressing the people side of it. It's all with all the planning. You know, I helped plan the, some of the censuses. I evaluated them, and I have not heard much about the people portion of it. And you should be doing studying that, just like the Census Bureau does. Okay? We're not all. We weren't all numbers. That's it. I'd like to thank everybody's participation from the community, from the county, from the RA, from CPR, and the other community organizations. Um, obviously, there's a lot of uh, passion in the community. There's a lot of um, investment of, um, by the, the, the county in doing the right thing. There's a lot of desire on the part of the people at the table to where we think things aren't quite right to get it better. And that's really what's, uh, what we hope comes out of this meeting. Um, Thank you all very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you guys very yeah. much. And, and I'd like to just say one last thing. <clears throat> Tonight we did not cover stormwater. We did not cover um, green things that we're concerned about. We didn't cover noise. We didn't, the stormwater goes into the dredging of our lakes, which costs us a lot of money. We didn't cover fire, which I apologize to you. We didn't cover police. So we do have a lot more detail that we would like to share and discuss then. But thank you so much to everyone. Well, I think the purpose of the report, the report, was to suggest that the four items that we need to be part of the discussion that we have.
Yeah, well, the public facilities took the schools, and that was a full night. You guys are athletes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Marathoners.